this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine scripture for today is from 1st John chapter 1 verses 1 through 7 we declare to you what was from the beginning what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes 
what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is a message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we are walking in the darkness, we lie and do not have what is true. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us all from sin. This concludes the reading of God's Word. Thanks, B. I want you to think about your first word. Think back and remember the very first thing that came out of your mouth. I recognize that that's probably not going to be easy to do. There are very few of us who actually remember our first words, but odds are you've probably been told what they are. For my brother, his first word was dada. And it's interesting to know that because my brother as he grew up always had a special relationship with my father they were both talented tennis players they were both highly competitive both very driven people and both of them grew up to be salesmen and when I know this it's hard for me not to wonder if there's some connection for some people between the first word they speak and the life that they will live. Now, it makes me wonder about myself. My first word wasn't dad, dad, it wasn't mama, and it's not because I don't love my dad or love my mom. My first word is something that I still find myself drawn to especially as I study and read and teach the Bible, as I preach, my first word was light. And maybe it's because of this, that it's subconsciously in my brain, this love of light that has led me to notice something from the Bible. That that word light comes up a lot. It is mentioned from the very start of the Bible to the very end, over and over again. I've told you before, and I will remind you, that if the Bible repeats something, it's important. Light is the one word that's used to describe what God does, who God is, what our relationship and response to God should look like. I want you to think about this for a moment. I'm going to let you inside of my head, which is a scary thought. Here, here's what I hear when I've read all of this together. The very first words, the very first words out of the mouth of God from the very first book of the Bible are, let there be light. All that is, all of creation, sprung forth from the mention of that one word into the dark, swirling chaos of the universe. Light. Light's also the first thing that God qualifies in Scripture. As God looks over the light that He has made that burst into being on that very first day of creation, and God pronounces that light, good. Look again at our call to worship, and you'll see that light cascades upon all that God is. In the book of Exodus, God reveals himself to Moses to the light of a burning bush, and God guides the people through the wilderness from slavery in Egypt to a promised land flowing with milk and honey, from the light of a pillar of fire from heaven in the darkness. The Psalms say that God's words give light. 
and that God's Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. When the prophet Isaiah shared with the people God's promise of a Messiah, of a Savior that would come to them, Isaiah worded it this way, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Jesus calls himself the light of the world. He tells us in the Sermon of the Mount the same thing I shared with the children this morning, that we are called to not hide our light, but to let it shine. For the people of God, the light of God's glory was more than some abstract concept or metaphor. It was very real. And we can see this in the tabernacle itself. The tabernacle is the tent that God tells Moses to build. And if you read the book of Exodus, the whole last part of it are very detailed instructions on how to build this tent. And inside of the tabernacle is what's called the Holy of Holies. And what separates that space from everywhere else in the tent of God that they take with them for 40 years through the wilderness is that there's no lights in there. There's no lamp. There's no oil lamp. There's no menorah in there. The walls are covered in gold and it is sealed tight because they believed that the light of God would shine so bright in that room by itself that they did not need a lamp. That it would reflect off of those gold walls and light up that space. We see this same literal light of God at the very end of the book. Light is at the beginning of the Bible. And light is at the end as well. When we look in the book of Revelation, the very last book in the Bible. A book that many of us are afraid to read. And I readily admit that. God shows John a grand conclusion to God's relationship with creation. A picture of what heaven will be like at the end of time when Christ returns to make all things new. John sees a vision of a city where God's people live among God, live among Jesus. And this city, just like the Holy of Holies, just like the inside of that tabernacle, this city has no lamps. And it doesn't have a sun either, or a moon, or stars, or any outside light of any kind. But even without these things, it's not a dark place but a brilliant, bright, and shining place. Because God and Jesus are standing there among the people, and there's no need for a lamp, or a sun, or a moon, or stars, because the glory of God with Christ as its lamp shines all the light we will ever need for eternity. I told you, light comes up again and again and again in this book. And I don't know if the author of 1 John's first words were light like mine, but for him, light is vital to understanding what we are called to be as a church. In the scripture that we read this morning, we see that light of God mentioned again. 1 John was written to one of the very first churches, and it reads like a sermon. It is a grand post-Easter declaration. The whole point of 1 John is to invite others into church, to invite them into fellowship with Christ, to join the church, to be true followers of Jesus. That's what this book is for. In only five chapters, this short text outlines who God is, who Christ is, what Christ has done for us through his death and resurrection, and what it means to really be a Christian. That's a lie. When John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist denomination, wrote about 1 John, here's what he had to say. He said, how plain, how full, and how deep a compendium of genuine Christianity. I like that. Compendium. It's not a word I get to use often. John Wesley loved the book of 1 John. And it begins with a person sharing this letter 
who people have thought to be John the disciple since the second century, even though he never shares his name, he starts by saying, I saw, I heard, and I touched Jesus. I saw, I heard, and I touched him. So you can tell that anything that I share from this point on is true. And after all of that, after seeing and hearing and touching the risen Christ, what is the takeaway? The takeaway is light. Light's the key, the point. I want to read to you verse 5 through 7 one more time. <coughs> The author of 1 John says, This is the message we've heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and we do not do what's true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. For John, God is light and God is only light there is no darkness present and it's the same light of God that shines on and through Jesus his son what we're supposed to do as followers as Christians as members of a church is walk within that light and when we do this when we walk within the light of God, that's when we can have fellowship with each other. That's when we know that we are cleansed of sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now this is a beautiful way to talk about God. A compendium of what it means to be a Christian. It's powerful, short, and it's to the point. And if we're really honest with ourselves, that's what we're looking for in every sermon. Powerful, short, and to the point. Now I admit to you, but even though I've read this sermon, 1 John, many times, and even though John Wesley claimed that it was plain and easy to understand, it's still a complicated concept. And I don't think I really got it. I don't think I really got what John was trying to say until I saw what's in front of the flowers on this table. For as long as I have preached, I've often heard people say that they got more out of the children's sermon than the grown-up sermon. And I could take offense at that, I really could, but, but I don't because it's true. Sometimes we need what a children's sermon provides. Sometimes we need an object lesson. This has been sitting on my desk for years, and I didn't realize just how much I needed an object lesson as well. Jesus understood this. This is what the parables were for. Jesus understood that heaven and God are really hard concepts to process. So we need examples like mustard seeds and lost sheep and lost coins. Family stories like a dad who waits up for a wayward son to be able to understand what God is doing. We need an object lesson. And so that's what I'm going to share with you this morning. This is an object lesson that I believe the Holy Spirit has been teaching to me since I got here and first set this on my desk. A lesson I didn't realize I needed. So this has been sitting up here the entire service. And I'm curious if anybody has ever seen one of these before and knows what it is. I'm holding it the right way. Like it sits on the table like this, but in reality, it goes this way. So most of you probably don't know what this is. This is a deck prism. It's from a boat, a ship, an old wooden sailing ship. It's from the days when boats were made of wood and the days before electricity was created. At that time period, People still had to get underneath the ship, even though there was no electricity. If you've ever seen any boat, if you ever watched Deadliest Catch or anything, you realize that you don't store all the stuff that you're carrying on top of the boat. You've got to put that inside. Problem is, that's where it's dark. That part of the boat is underwater partially. You can't see where you're going, so they needed to have a light down there. When they first started sailing on those wooden boats, they brought kerosene lamps and candles. 
and oil lamps down with them to light their way, which worked but was a problem. And it was a problem because the boats were made of wood. And if you carry fire underneath into a wooden boat, it's an issue because boats don't sit still. They get beaten on by the waves outside and occasionally those people would drop that candle and drop that lamp and set the boat on fire without meaning to. And then somebody thought of this, a deck prism. So the way this worked is they'd cut a hole in the deck, a hole that would go from the top of the boat down into that dark area, and they would set this down in the hole, flush with the floor on the upper part of the deck. Light would then come from the sun or the moon or the stars and come down through here and light up underneath that ship so that people could see without setting the boat on fire. It was a great idea, a deck prism. And it's a pretty neat thing to have sitting on my desk, I admit. But as I read this scripture and thought about how often light comes up in the Bible, started looking at what 1 John is saying about the light of God. I started to see God and Christ and ourselves in what this object does. Christ is like this. He provides light in the darkness for us to see that would not be there if He were not present. Like the deck prism, the light that Jesus provides to us doesn't come from Him alone, but it comes from God, shining through Him to each of us. God is the source of light. We see that in the very beginning of the Bible. God is the creator of light, the sender of light. And 1 John makes the claim that God is light. And Christ is what God uses to shine that light down into the darkness where we happen to be. Another reason that this deck prism works it's because it's exposed to two sides of the ship, two different realities. It's exposed to the outside where the light is, where the sun is, and it's able to gather that light and spread it out into the darkness. It exists in two worlds, and that's how it works. And so does Jesus Christ. Here you have a man who is straddling the eternal and the temporal, who has one foot in heaven where God lives and one foot in the mire on earth where we live. And it's because he exists between those two planes that is he, he is able to bring the light from heaven down here to us. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. A deck prism could be seen by everybody. It wasn't just for the captain of the ship. It could be used by the guy that was lowest on the totem pole of crew, the guy whose job it was to scrape the barnacles off the side of the boat. This light could be used by all of them. Just as Christ's light from God is offered freely to everyone. Freely to anybody who chooses to walk within it. And that's the key. That's the key right there, is that choice. That choice to walk within the light. Now I know that there are probably some sailors who'd been on that boat before and probably knew, thought they knew better and didn't think they needed to walk right where this light was shining and just kind of meandered off into the darkness to bring things down into the hold. And we all know what happens when you don't walk in the light, you fall down. You scrape yourself up. This is very similar to our relationship with Christ. When we walk outside where that light is shining, it sometimes hurts. Many of us, myself included, still bear the scars of our attempts to walk outside the light. There are other people 
who thought that they could do better, I'm sure, that even though they had this safe way for light to shine on them, still decided to bring those old kerosene lamps down with them anyway. Those old candles down with them anyway. They brought their own light. Or they followed what they thought was a better light from someone else. We do this. When we start following what we want. When we start following what someone else says. When it seems easier than what Christ asks of us. When we start seeking the success that the world proclaims and not what Christ asks of us. We start walking with our own light in the darkness, thinking that it's good enough. We do that. And the problem is, eventually one of two things happen to us. Eventually that light blows out, and we're stuck in place, not sure where to go from there. Or, when the waves kick up and life gets hard, and the boat seems to jostle back and forth, we drop that light and find ourselves scrambling to find a bucket to put out the fire of our best laid plans. A fire that has now spread itself to be a danger to us and other people. We know what it's like for our own sin to spill out onto others. And the most powerful thing about this example, this object lesson that has sat on my desk, is even though I'm sure a bunch of sailors didn't use it very well and still ran into the sides of the boat and dropped things, it didn't turn this off. Just because they failed to use it didn't mean that it stopped shining. That's the way Christ is for us. Just because we failed, just because we've fallen short, just because we thought we knew better, doesn't change the fact that Christ is still there waiting to lead us again. Now I'll make something perfectly clear. When we stand under the light of Christ, when we walk within that light, we are forgiven, but it doesn't change the fact that those scars still exist. Jesus himself is a testament to that. He emerges from death on Easter Sunday, but still bears the scars of our sin. We know what it's like to still carry the scars, but Christ offers a way for those not to be the only thing that we carry. John says that if you join the fellowship, if you walk within the light of Christ, there's joy. He says that he's only telling you these things so that it makes his joy complete and it makes your joy complete. That's what this is about. Following in the light should be a place of joy. It helps us to realize something very important. And I'll walk down here so you can see it better. And I'll kind of pull over to the side so the choir can see it as well. For me, as I sat in my office looking at this each day, the reason that this showed me uh, who Christ was more than anything else was the fact that you could see that light reflected from it on to me. That's who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to walk in the light of Christ so that we can be a reflection of that light on others. That's what a church is. That's what Christians are. That's the whole point of all of this. I don't set it down without lighting myself on fire and being a very different kind of object lesson. So here's my hope today. My hope today is that we choose to walk in the light. My hope is the same as that of John who wrote 1 John. That we walk so that we can be reflections. So that light can be seen bouncing off of us. So that we may be able to let that light shine in the darkness. So that when God says... Let there be light. God can see that light bouncing off of us and still see that that light is good. Amen. 
a light in the darkness. That's what this book is about. It begins by God sending his light in the darkened chaos of the universe to create everything. It continues where God calls his prophets by showing them the light, leading them in the darkness with a pillar of fire. It continues when the people are in the darkness of exile. God provides the word as a light unto their feet. And finally, Christ himself provides us not only with access to that light, but provides us the opportunity to be reflections of it. To be reflections of the very first word of God. That's what Christ does for us. So my hope today, as we leave and go out into the world, that by our actions, by our love, and by our care, our prayer to God is not, let there be light, but let me be light. Amen. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.